the correlation between science and manifestation. This video will contain the research that I've done on the relation between quantum physics, measuring thoughts as waves and frequencies, and spirituality. And I'll show you exactly how far we've gotten with science and also what the limits are of science, which is science only measures the physical. As a person with a background in science, I never used to believe in spirituality and manifestation. And it is only when I started to study the science behind manifestation or the correlation that I see is when I truly started to believe in it. And today I want to give you a proper insight into that correlation. That terms that you often hear, quantum jumping. How is that related to the actual quantum field theory, how we know that in physics? This video is meant for the people that really want to understand it as thoroughly as I like to understand things from a quantitative perspective. Level of science in this video is probably A level physics and chemistry. In this video, I'll explain the concepts of quantum jumping. What proof do we have for measuring thoughts as waves. I'll explain how manifestation is related to the quantum field theory. In the second part of the video, I'll also go into how to actually apply the theories that I explained. I'm Davy. I am a PhD student in chemical engineering at the University of Cambridge. And in my free time, I love to study anything related to law of attraction, manifestation, spirituality, and how I will elucidate in this video, the quantum physics of manifestation and the research that I've done on this. I am a quantitative girl at heart. Uh, my favorite course has always been mathematics, calculus, thermodynamics, quantum chemistry, physics. So it is only when I started to consider spirituality from a quantitative perspective is when it started to make sense to me and perhaps that goes for you as well and if that is the case keep watching this video this is my interpretation of the correlation that i see between science and spirituality so i'm linking einstein's planck's and heisenberg's quantum physical theories back to manifestation and i will also show you exactly how far we've gotten with actually getting scientific proof for this because there are limits to what we've been able to measure in science and i'll show you exactly what these limits are based on i am I'm trying to keep it simple and sort of understandable for people that might not have done any courses in science. As a PhD student, I can tell you that science is always about strong correlation. Science is always about suggesting hypotheses. And I want you to understand that this is the correlation that I see. As I said in my previous Science Behind Manifestation video, the way to view manifestation is that our thoughts are frequencies and trying to manifest something is like aligning your frequency to the right reality. It's like tuning in. So the analogy that I made is you're the radio sending off signals and the universe has all of these radio channels you are trying to tune into, right? So now I want to give you the scientific explanation of why can we consider our thoughts as waves and how is this related to quantum jumping and the quantum field theory. Get ready for a low-key physics chemistry lecture I've prepared seven slides let's get into it what I first want you to understand is why are we considering thoughts as waves we already know one thing that we can consider as waves which is light light is a wave that travels with the speed of light light is on an electromagnetic spectrum so what that means, this image over here shows the complete electromagnetic spectrum. We as humans are only able to absorb the visible spectrum, which is the visible light that we see, the rainbow colors. But in fact, there are many more frequencies of electromagnetic radiation, is what we call it, or light. And the further we go to the left, the more energy. This is what we use in imaging, right? X-rays when it comes to medicine, UV, we've probably heard of, which is what we get a tan of, right? All of these radiations travel with the speed of light, but they all have a different frequency and a different associated energy, because light is actually energy. And the thing about light, light has no mass, which means it has no defined location in space and time. What do I mean by that? It spreads everywhere and we can't specifically define its location. Now, why can we consider thoughts as waves as well? We've done EEGs on the brain. We've measured electromagnetic signals in the brain when thoughts occur. Therefore, you can understand that thoughts are somewhat similar to light. They also have a frequency and they also are waves. Now, we've been able to measure thoughts as waves inside the brain or thoughts as electromagnetic signals inside the 
brain and a little bit outside of the scalp, but not much further than that. Now, science is limited by the physical. Physics literally means the study of the physical, the physical particles. So what can we measure in science? Particles. What do we already know about, you know, about what life consists of? We first understood that life consists of molecules. You might have heard of a few molecules such as glucose and proteins, that is what we eat, but we as humans are made up of molecules, the table is made up of molecules, everything is made up of molecules. Now we went a level deeper, what are molecules made of, right? These little balls over here, each of those are atoms. So the fundamental elements of life, everything around us, everything physical is made of atoms. Uh, examples of atoms are carbon, oxygen, hydrogen. It's what molecules are made of. And what is the difference between different types of atom? How does a carbon differ from an oxygen? How does it differ from a hydrogen? Through one thing, they have a different mass. And this is important to remember. Now, we've even went one level deeper in science. What are atoms made of? And this image over here shows the similar, this one is just a bit more detailed. Uh, now, what are atoms made of? We can see that at the nucleus, at the center, we have protons and neutrons. And around that, there are electrons circulating. In the same way where planets are, you know, revolving around the sun, we have electrons that have an orbital or circulate around the nucleus. This is what atoms are made of. Now, this is what we can measure in science, particles. This is the physical world. And what makes a particle? A particle has a mass. What does it mean to have a mass? What, what it actually means to have a mass is that we know the position in time and space. That is what a mass is. We can see it, we can observe it. And mass can always be converted into energy. And the other way around, mass and energy are interchangeable. And this is what Einstein discovered when he developed E is MC squared. E stands for energy, M stands for mass, and C stands for the speed of light. So what this equation shows is that energy can be converted into mass, or mass can be converted into energy, and energy is never lost. But this is even when we eat food, that is energy, right? That is mass that is absorbed into our bodies, and then we use the energy, and the energy is released again. These two quantities are interchangeable. Now what is interesting is that the interchangeability of these two quantities, the conversion, it has a proportionality with the speed of light. Now, why am I mentioning this? We're now talking about mass, we're talking about the physical, we're talking about particles, but we see that the speed of light, which was a frequency where we don't know anything about the mass, where we don't know anything about the location, this quantity already comes back here. So there is this correlation between particles and waves. I will elucidate further. Now, this is where science was left off, and I'm talking about the 1900s. We know about waves on the one hand. They travel with the speed of light, they have a frequency, they have an energy, they have no mass, they have no defined location in space or time. We can't locate it, we can't observe it at a location. We know it's everywhere, and we can only measure light when it interacts with mass. We can't measure light itself. We can only measure light when it interacts with, you know, the sensor or however we're trying to measure the light, right? It needs the interaction with the physical, interaction with mass. And the frequency electromagnetic radiation is the velocity over its wavelength. And the energy of electromagnetic radiation is the Planck constant times its frequency. Now you might think, why am I showing this equation here? This Planck constant is what's going to come back later as well. On the other hand, we know about particles. Particles do have a mass. They also have energy, which is interchangeable with the mass according to Einstein's relationship. And we know exactly of particles where they are in time and space. We can see them. We know where they are. And this is where the relativity theory of Einstein comes in. What mass actually is, is that it deforms time and space. So what does that mean? We need an interaction of mass and space to create time. The difference between different masses, all, all that really means for one person to be heavier than another or one atom to be heavier than another is that you have a different way of deforming the space and the time. So what the mass of the earth does, it's a force 
that curves the fabric of space and time of the force of the gravity is shown over here. And what this equation also shows is that the larger the mass, the greater the force. And that's also why different planets have different gravities. Everything of mass has a gravitational force. Everything of mass can pull towards. Everything of mass can deform space and time. And I also want you to understand that the only difference between atoms, why do we observe them as differently? Well, it's just because they deform space and time in a different way. But all it means, they have a different gravitational pull. They have a different way of deforming space and time, which in the observation, we've defined as, okay, they have a different mass. Now, this is where quantum physics came in. This is where Heisenberg came in. We've always considered waves as waves and particles as particles. Now, Heisenberg showed that actually light is both a particle and a wave through the photoelectric effect. But we cannot measure these properties at the same time. Every particle, electrons, atoms, molecules, protons, the, the, the particles that I just discussed, are also waves. But the larger the mass, the less we can observe it as a wave. So we've seen photons have, the light particles have no mass. So again, I want you to understand wave, for a wave, we have no location in space and time. We just have a velocity and an associated momentum. And momentum is just Planck constant divided by the wavelength. For particles, we know exactly where they are. That's the definition of it being a particle. And the, the interval of the location we find it in is what we quantify as delta x. Which I said, we cannot measure wave properties and particle properties at the same time. And that is where the uncertainty principle of Heisenberg came in. The delta here shows the uncertainty or interval it should exist in. Delta X is the uncertainty in position, which is a particle property. And delta P is the uncertainty in momentum, which is a wave property. Now, what this shows is that the larger the uncertainty in position, the smaller the uncertainty in momentum and the other way around. So all this equation shows is that the more we know about the position, the less we can measure it as being a wave. And again, this Planck constant is what defines the proportionality here. Now we're going into the quantum field theory. So quantum physics has said particles are waves, waves are particles, but never at the same time, right? If we go back to atoms, atoms, the building blocks of life, they have at the core the protons and around that the orbitals or circular pathways with electrons. Now to move one electron, which is in the first orbital to another, it needs more energy. That's the excitation of the electrons. And we can give the electrons energy through radiation of light. And this is shown over here. So this line over here would be one orbital and this line over here would be a second orbital. This electron, this is that purple one over there. Through the excitation, so by giving it energy, and we can give electrons energy by shining light on it, it will excite to the next state. The energy of the photon is absorbed to bring, to bring, the, electron, to bring the electron to the next orbital or to its excited state. And what do I want you to understand about this quantum field theory? Why is this interesting? The word quantum stands for quantized. The levels the electron can exist in are discrete. Electron cannot exist in between. We can literally only measure it going from one level to another. And we know nothing about the electron's whereabouts in between. We literally don't even know if it exists. And this is also another limit of science, right? Does that mean the electron just doesn't exist anymore between those two states? Probably not, but we cannot measure it. Why? It doesn't have a mass. It's not observable in space and time. So do you understand that there are things that we cannot measure in science or there are things because they're not physical, they're not having a defined position in space time means we cannot measure them. In between these states, we cannot measure the electron. Does that mean it doesn't exist? No, it doesn't. And that's what I want you to get at with manifestation as well later on. 
you know, keep this in mind. It doesn't mean things don't exist when we cannot measure them, yeah? And all of these levels combined, the levels it can exist in, is what we call the quantum field. More clearly shown over here. So we have all of these levels the electron can exist in. I've shown a wave here because, as I said, an electron is a particle, but it can also behave as a wave. So we have these different levels an electron or particles in general can exist in inside the quantum field. And only at the quantum levels we can observe the particle, we, which means we know its location in space and time. What is important to understand is the entanglement. These different levels are related. They cannot exist without each other. These different quantum states or the particles where particles exist in are entangled. And what is interesting is well, the gaps in between these quantum states are proportional to the Planck constant. To get from one level to another to excite an electron, we provided light, which is then the Planck constant times the frequency of the light that we provided. Now, going back to manifestation, as I said, we need the energy of light to excite particles from one quantum level to another. This is what we call a quantum jump. Now, we know that thoughts are waves. Thoughts have no mass, which means they're not bound by space-time. Thoughts go beyond space and time. And this is interesting. We're talking about something that is not in our physical world here, right? If we assume that the quantum field theory holds for all things that behave as waves, which is everything in this world, actually, then we can say our thoughts also exist in a quantum field. And then the quantum levels are the different realities that we observe. So these quantum levels, when we're talking about thoughts, are then the realities that we live in. Now, how can we give our thoughts energy? We can give thoughts energy through emotions. Emotions are energy in motion. So we know that emotions contain energy. The suggestion that I want to make here is that the emotions is what we can use as humans, that's our light, to make quantum jumps, to go from one thought to another. Because how do we feed thoughts energy through emotions? And quantum jumping to different realities, which actually just means aligning to different thoughts, aligning your vibration, your energy to different thoughts, just means providing different em emotions to different thought frequencies. Is there proof for what I'm trying to say? I want you to understand, thoughts as waves in the quantum field, is there proof for that? Answer is no. And I will also want you to understand why. Because providing physical evidence for something means locating it in time and space. I already said thoughts go beyond time and space. Whilst thoughts have no mass or known interaction with particles other than the brain. So the only way we've so far been able to measure thoughts is in the brain because then it interacts with mass, right? But we haven't been able to measure it outside of the brain because it goes beyond space and time. Also, I want you to understand that the Heisenberg uncertainty plays a role in this limitation of science because measuring precise location, measuring mass, observing something can never be done when something is acting as a wave. And we cannot measure anything without mass unless it interacts with mass. So it gives energy to mass, which is, I guess, when we manifest things is when we give it energy and it comes into this physical reality. But this in-between gap between the thought in the brain and something actually manifesting into the physical, which is when it turns into mass again, this gap we've not been able to measure. Some physicists argue current physical instruments that we have might never be able to capture consciousness outside of the brain. And actually, I don't want to say never because we never know how advanced science is going to get. But I do want you to understand that the limit of the current physical instruments that we have do not allow for measurements of consciousness or thought waves outside of the brain, which are not bound by space and time. The conclusions. Everything is frequency. We know this. For so for people that still ask, how do you know that thought is a frequency? Well, first of all, we have measurements inside of the brain of thought waves. Second of all, everything is frequency. Everything that has energy also has a frequency. This is known in quantum physics, yeah? Also, thought waves need mass or interaction with the physical to find a location and measure them. 
right? At some point when we try to measure things in the physical world with a sensor, whatever we use, that is a physical device. So it needs an interaction with the physical. So it needs an interaction with the physical. And I want you to understand thoughts are not bound by time and space. That's the definition of something not having mass. Now, finally, in the quantum field, if the quantum field theory holds for thought waves, but well, we've only proven it for subatomic and atomic particles. If that holds true, then quantum jumping from one level to another requires a jump of energy. And we can provide the energy through the emotions. That's how we feed our thoughts. That was my elaborate explanation of the correlation in IC between quantum physics and manifestation. Now let's get into the practical. How can we use all of this information to manifest? So we understand now that thoughts are waves or different frequencies and we can align to thoughts by giving them our energy, which is our emotions. And in my opinion, this whole scientific explanation shows is that no thought is true on its own. Every thought exists in this quantum field of different thoughts or realities. It's just the thought that we give energy that then turns into our reality. What I got from this is that I now, through understanding this, is that I understand infinite, infinite possibilities of the universe. If there is this quantum field with all of these thoughts and all of these possibilities, then it just takes giving the right thoughts your energy to get into your desired reality. What I also want you to understand is that you do have a choice. When thoughts arise, when thoughts are presented to you, they're not true on their own yet. They'll only become true, they'll only become reality, manifesting in space-time, when you give them your energy. Every time when a thought is presented to you, a negative one, I want you to understand this thought is not true on its own. It's just a thought in our quantum field. And if we choose, if we choose to not give it our energy, it will not become our reality. If we feel fear for something, you know, something we're afraid of that we have to do or something that we're dreading, giving it energy is what makes it reality. And if anything, you being scared is what manifests a bad experience. Because if you're scared of something or you're dreading something, that means you're assuming something bad is gonna happen. You're giving that your energy and that is gonna become your reality. It is almost like being scared is what creates negative outcomes, not the other way around. You're scared of a negative outcome, but actually you're creating a negative outcome. No negative outcomes are pre-planned. It is only when we give it energy things can go south, things can go bad. So whenever we feel fearful and we need to understand we're subconsciously or consciously assuming a negative outcome, our energy is what creates the reality, not the other way around. So whenever that happens, try to think of the opposite. Try to think of the best scenario outcome. When you're dreading something, let's say an event you have to go to or something else that you have to do, try to picture the best possible outcome. How would it feel for it to go perfect, to go smoothly. Everyone is nice to you, everyone is kind, your story flows well, you're, you're being yourself, you're feeling confident. How does that feel? And give that energy because then you're creating a reality. If you can hold that emotion for long enough, you, you've given it enough energy to align to that reality. And whenever you're scared, don't try to force it away because the more force we give to something that is energy as well and we're actually then still calling it into creation but try to go back to the understanding that you are the creator you have the power to choose and if you choose to give negative outcomes energy you'll create negative outcomes for yourself go back to choosing which thought waves you want to align to what thoughts feel good to you and the thoughts that don't feel good to you if they're presented to you you can reject them by not giving your energy if i if i have something that i'm dreading or scared of I know that I am then asking for a bad outcome and you're constantly manifesting. So then I'll go to the opposite, picture the best scenario outcome. And I realize I can ask for that outcome. I can create that outcome. I decide I am the creator of my life and you are the creator of your life. So take back that power. Understand that every thought in this universe exists. Every reality in this universe exists and it is up to us to give the right thoughts our energy 
to then align to the reality that we desire. And of course, it also requires action after, but you have to understand that manifestation leads to inspired action. It won't be a difficult one. If you're already aligned to your desire, you will have an inspirational thought and it will feel easy to take action on that. It will come from flow. It first requires you to believe in that possibility, to even think of your desired reality or your desired outcome. All right, I'm gonna leave it at this. Let me know in the comments what you thought of this video, if it was understandable for you and if it helped you in any way. Uh, leave me a like, comment, subscribe to my channel. I truly, truly appreciate every single one of you guys that is here. So I'm sending you all my love. 